Good afternoon and welcome to our program, 12 Funeral Myths. My name is Shanae McPherson. I am the Volunteer Connect 55 Plus Administrator for Orange County Department on Aging. And on behalf of the department and also on behalf of the End of Life Choices Senior Resource Team, I'd like to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Thank you to our Senior Resource Team members that are here for the program. I see several of you, so thank you. Thank you to the Department on Aging staff. And also thank you to our Director Janice Tyler for your continued support and guidance. So funeral costs can create a great concern and anxiety for many people and their loved ones. As annual costs continue to rise, on average, a person can expect to spend over $8,000 for a traditional service. Today's program will provide valuable information regarding funeral consumer rights and useful options that can save families thousands of dollars. 12 Funeral Myths will explore common misconceptions about funeral practices and how to navigate the process of creating the funeral of your choice. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter this afternoon, Sarah Williams. Sarah is a home funeral guide and funeral memorial celebrant with over eight years of providing end of life education, counseling and services throughout the Piedmont and Triangle areas. Sarah is a board member of the National Home Funeral Alliance and a past director of her local Consumer Alliance. Thank you, Sarah, for agreeing to present for us this afternoon, and we look forward to all the valuable information you're going to give us. So I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Amelia and Shanae. Uh, that's the first person I'm going to thank. I'm going to get my screen up here. Um, Let's start, let's get that done. And then wanting to thank um, Shanae so much for her excellent marketing job. I mean, she's just done a wonderful job and I, I really thank the Orange County Department on Aging. Also, Ann Weston is out there in Zoom land among you and I always have to thank her because she said to me, oh, a year and a half ago, Sarah, we know a lot of information and we need to be making some PowerPoints. So this uh, is one of the PowerPoints I created. One disclaimer, I do wear several hats in the death and dying arena. And today I'm gonna speak to you in my role as president of the Funeral Consumers Alliance, North Carolina. And if you're not familiar with FCA, we are a 501c3 organization funded by your donations. We're not associated with the funeral industry at all. And so we pride ourselves on being able to give you fair and equitable information about how to shop for and buy funeral goods and services if you choose to do so. And this presentation was developed for that very reason, to inform you of your rights when it comes to purchasing funeral goods and services. Because quite simply, you can't know what you don't know. So again, thank you all for being here today. I don't know if you ever stop to think about the land uh, that you're on. I uh, like to begin by acknowledging and recognizing the traditional ancestral territory where we all live, learn, and work today. There were ancient caretakers of this land, people who were subject to centuries of oppression. We are located on the traditional territory of the Catawba people who settled the Carolina Piedmont over 10,000 years ago. And we honor and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this territory that we know today as the state of North Carolina, including the Kahari, the Lumbee, the Meharan, 
the Okanichi Saponi, the Hollowa Saponi, the Waccamaw Suwon, the Saponi, and the Eastern Band of the Cherokee. Thank you. So it's really helpful to have a little introduction and background uh, before we get into the 12 funeral myths. And you can just imagine that funerals have been part of human life for as far back as archeologists can trace our species. Humans intuitively knew simple skills to care for the dead. The oldest known burial is thought to have taken place 130,000 years ago. And archeological evidence shows that Neanderthals practiced the burying of the dead, usually along with tools and bones. And the most popular belief about why people buried the bodies was because dead bodies decay. And so the best way to deal with that decay was to bury the body um, and take away the smell. It's easy to dig a hole in the ground and bury the body to prevent the smell from disturbing the community. And they did this with animals as well. And until the late 1800s, families took care of their own dead. Most of the world still does. We washed and dressed the bodies. We built the caskets, dug the graves. Services were held in the home and burial in the churchyard or even on a personal property. Some of you may even remember the laying out of relatives or friends or heard stories about this from your parents or grandparents. And I encourage you, um, for those of us who are still blessed enough to have grandparents and even great grandparents to ask them about what they could remember about home funerals. So eventually we will, as we're gonna see, funeral homes replaced home funerals. Even though home funerals are still a legal and attractive option for many people, we're gonna talk about that later. Most people are content to use a funeral home and we respect that choice. The intention here is to explore some common misconceptions about funeral laws, rights, and options. And we wanna educate you because as I said earlier, you simply can't know what you don't know. Now development of our modern funeral industry is directly traced to the Civil War. Thousands of Union soldiers, the Johnnies who couldn't go marching home, were dying on Southern battlefields and the railroads refused to transport their decaying corpses. So enter the field embalmers who used arsenic mixed with zinc, mercuric chloride, creosote, turpentine, and alcohol to preserve the bodies. And hey, it worked. As the war continued, these field embalmers just followed the action and they would take over a barn or a shed near the battlefield and even set up a tent and embalm bodies there. And one of the pictures that I haven't included here shows an embalmed body upright in one of those toe pincher coffins because the, the field embalmer wants you to see how good his work is. So after the war, many Americans first became aware of the option of embalming following President Lincoln's assassination. And as you recall, his embalmed body traveled across the country to get him back to Springfield. And it was an almost three week journey. And yes, he was embalmed more than once. The public was very 
anxious to see him. They loved President Lincoln. And folks marveled at the fact that he didn't look dead, but just asleep. And soon the elite wanted to be embalmed. I mean, if it's good enough for Lincoln, why not that? So to market all these new chemicals and ways of doing things to the greater population, mortuary schools were established. And soon this professional class group, they were called morticians. Hmm, sounds like physicians. Local builders and cabinet makers and contractors were becoming undertakers and cabinet makers branching out into other areas and making coffins. So these embalming surgeons are the direct forerunners of today's licensed funeral directors and the training programs they began to create to pass on their skills in turn led to today's schools of mortuary science. Then came the early funeral homes and the goal here was to keep the funeral home looking like our personal parlors. So they were called funeral parlors, set up to look like our front parlors. Then in 1910, the Ladies Home Journal published an article and changed the use of the term parlor to living room. So now this front parlor was no longer associated with death or dying, but a lively room where the family gathered to hang out and just, um, you know, have a good time. It wasn't any longer dedicated to death. And then 1963, Jessica Mitford's book, The American Way of Death, was published. This was a classic indictment of the funeral industry. And her language and approach were often aggressive and scathing. Funeral directors, even today, still speak of being Mitfordized by this book. Um, the Funeral Consumers Alliance in any chapter across the country and here in North Carolina, we're, we're not out to bash the funeral industry, but rather we want to heighten consumer awareness about the forces that have led to expensive funeral practices and of your rights and options when it comes to sort of um, counter these forces. So now let's look and examine, look at and examine the 12 funeral myths one by one. Myth number one, how much you spend on a funeral indicates how much you care. Well, for most families, a funeral represents one of the most costly items over a lifetime, exceeded only by a mortgage, a car, and a college education. But unlike those purchases, the home, the car, and the education, most funeral consumers are having to make these decisions, their buying decisions, at the time of need. When time is limited, they're grieving, and there's really no time for comparative shopping. And oh my, did you think that funeral homes posted their prices online? Hmm, they don't, not usually. In the vast majority of cases, you have to really dig or reach out to them yourselves. And I know that any of you who are shopping for appliances or cars, probably the first thing you do is comparative shop and you do that online. So. Um, Emotions are high. People shopping at this point in their lives are vulnerable to manipulations by well-honed sales tactics. And if 
Funeral Consumers Alliance, North Carolina, wants to encourage every consumer to pre-plan and let your family and friends know of your wishes before you die. We don't promote any single type of funeral arrangement over another, but we certainly give you cultural permission to spend less. You should be frugal here as you are with any other purchase you make. And I love to tell the story that Ann told me of how when her grandparents had their funeral, they were buried in better furniture than they lived on when they were alive. And they're really, why are we doing this? Myth number two, the best way to pay for a funeral is through a prepaid contract with the funeral home. Well, what we tell consumers is don't prepay, but pre-plan. And it sounds really easy. Like we're gonna take care of everything. Give us your money now, nothing will change. Well, guess what? Everything will be taken care of. It's really not possible. What if the funeral home is sold? What if prices actually go down? What if you buy one plan and then become more interested in something else, but you can't get out of the one you've paid into? So again, thinking about these things and planning ahead is something we definitely recommend, but we never want you to prepay. Um, there are alternative ways to save money, have money set aside for your funeral. Um, we like a payable on death account, a POD, and any bank can do this for you. They're sometimes referred to as Totten Trust. So what happens, you name a beneficiary, you set aside X amount of dollars and on your death, the money is given to the beneficiary that you've named and your funeral expenses are taken care of as soon as the death certificate um, is shown. Um, and that way you're holding on to your money. Really, it's just kind of in this savings account. So that's what we suggest. Myth number three, you can't take it with you. Well, this is the Funeral Consumer Alliance's way of saying, uh, we wanna introduce you to the general price list or the GPL. And every single funeral home by law has to have a price list. And while it may not be online, if you show up in person, this is the first piece of paper they should give you. This is um, so important. You can call a funeral home and try to get price information. More than likely, they will start talking to you about bundled services. So it may be that you have to go in person to actually get the price list unless you ask them to mail it to you and they really uh, will do that. The funeral rule of 1984 was established by the Federal Trade Commission and this is one of their requirements that a funeral home has to have a price list and there are items that they must give you specific prices about and they can't bundle things together. Um, just an FYI, the Funeral Consumers Alliance, North Carolina has done this work for you. Our website is funeralsnc dot o-r-g we have canvassed over 
200 funeral homes in our state and published the, these prices online to help you with shopping. And you cannot believe that in the same town for the same service, the variance in the prices. It's, re it's really something to see. This is why right now, Funeral Consumers Alliance chapters are urging the Federal Trade Commission to update their funeral rule of 90, 1984 to make it mandatory that all funeral homes publish their prices online. That was a lot of information in one slide. Myth four, it's illegal to care for your own dad in your own home. Oh, well, somebody arrest me. That's me in the picture on the left, helping dear friends with Kate's washing and anointing. She was at home for three days. I use something um, called Techni Ice to keep the body cool. The family worked on their own time. You can read more about this particular funeral. It was covered by Esquire magazine online. And the name of the story is Kate's Still Here. And this is a beautiful example of what is involved with the home funeral. The state of North Carolina, thank heavens, is a home funeral friendly state. We have two statutes, North Carolina General Statute 130A-112 and 130A-115, which give us, the family, the right to act as the funeral director and also to file the death certificate. There are only, you can also legally transport the body. There are only nine states in the country that require the use of a licensed funeral director. And that's usually for mundane tasks like paperwork or to actually witness a burial or a cremation. And those states are Connecticut, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, Michigan, Nebraska, New Jersey, and New York. Myth five, you have to buy the casket from the funeral home that serves you. Simply not true. The funeral rule, remember that funeral rule of 1984, it gives you the right to bring your own coffin or shroud to a funeral home and they can't charge a handling fee. They have to accept it. And just to let you know, we have a local coffin builder in Hillsboro, John Joel with Alder Grove Caskets and a shroud maker in Mebane, Pat Scheibel. I'm happy to share that information with you at the end of this presentation. Be aware that casket sales are one of the ways they're income producing for the funeral home. So your markup is in this area. So just know that you do not have to buy a casket from the funeral home. Myth six, a vault or grave liner is required by law. So no North Carolina law requires this and a funeral home cannot claim this. Cemeteries can, and th this is, Often the problem, cemeteries set their own rules and regulations, and they may require a vault or a grave liner. And um, guess why? If you've ever been in a cemetery, an older cemetery, you'll notice that the ground can sink down. Well, this is going to be a problem in a cemetery to someone who wants to keep it landscaped 
and manicured and mowed. So the vault keeps the land perfectly straight. So that little dude on the lawnmower has no problems navigating the cemetery. Also, your backhoe operator, if he accidentally goes a little to the left or a little to the right and taps a vault, this kind of um, alerts him to the fact that, oops, I need to back up literally and because I'm in somebody else's grave. Um, vault started to be used in large part in the 20s and 30s uh, still, and steel vaults became the norm. As time went by, concrete came became more popular because we needed the steel for armaments during World War II. Again, this is based on what the cemetery requires, not the state. Um, and this is a time for me to give you some statistics on conventional burial in the United States. Every year here in the United States, we bury 104,000 tons of steel, 1.6 million tons of concrete, we bury 2,700 tons of copper and bronze. We use 45 million board feet of lumber, which is often imported from the rainforest and our precious hardwoods. And we use 827,000 gallons of formaldehyde-based embalming fluid. So this is where I love to point out that in a green or natural cemetery, you wouldn't have to worry about any of these things because there's no vault, there's no impervious container, and there's no embalming. Myth seven, you have to be embalmed. Well, guess what? Embalming is never required in any state by law. It's not only invasive, but requires the use of known carcinogenic chemicals. And you know what? It doesn't really matter for the dead person. I mean, they're dead. It's the embalmer, the people who are doing this embalming, who are being exposed. And it is a known fact that there is a statistically significant increased risk for mortality from myeloid leukemia and other cancers for these embalmers. And again, it's another profit-making um, option for the funeral home. The point of embalming is to um, delay any physical changes in the body. And in this country, and in um, other places around the world, but not a lot. It's, it's mainly here in this country. Uh, people are just not used to seeing a dead body. We don't talk about death where we can't imagine that we could be around a dead body. And they are taught in, in mortuary school, they're taught the concept of the memory picture. Oh, I want to see Aunt Bessie as she looked when she was asleep. Well, you know, Aunt Bessie doesn't look so bad natural either. I can, I can tell you that. Um, we keep the body cool with simple ice packs. We use essential oil. There is no odor. And families are allowed to have that open coffin if they want. Um, and we just need to, if, if you're going to use a funeral home, be sure that you find a funeral directors that can work with you if, if in fact you choose not to do the embalming. Myth eight, embalming protects the public health. 
This is the one myth that will not die. And yet the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control, the Center for Infectious Disease and Research, and the Pan American Health Organization have all declared that the average dead body is neither dangerous nor contagious. In fact, we are more dangerous to each other alive than we are dead. The bacteria promoting decay are not the same bacteria that cause infection. And um, as I've mentioned, we, you can use dry ice. I prefer not to use it. I think it's a little bit dangerous, but something called techni ice or simple air conditioning and air packs, uh, ice packs can keep the body sufficiently cooled and preserved until final disposition. There's that guy in the toe pincher coffin that I was talking about, the field embalmers really sh showing off this work. Myth nine, metal caskets with sealed gaskets offer superior protection. Well, again, we're back to the funeral home um, selling caskets with a little something extra. They, these terms, Metal caskets are often um, described as gasketed, protective, or sealer caskets. And it means that this little rubber gasket, which at Lowe's or Home Depot cost about $7.50. But trust me, it's a lot more expensive at the funeral home. And that the goal is to get you to believe that this is going to delay the penetration of water and prevent rust. The funeral rule forbids claims that these features help preserve the remains indefinitely because they do not. They just add to the cost of the casket. And actually in this anaerobic or no oxygen environment, it can really become this microbial soup. So don't be scammed. I'm just here to tell you we will all decompose eventually. Myth number 10, you can't bury your own dead on your own property. Well, yes, you can. All you have to do is research your local ordinances, check with your local health department to find out what your setback rules are. That simply means you have to be X amount of feet from a property line, X amount of feet from a source of water. Um, they'll send someone out to survey your property. You are required to make a reveal on your property deed. You'll take a piece of paper and you'll hand draw a map. X will mark the spot where you might like to bury Aunt Bessie. And the importance of having this map drawn and attached to your real estate deed is because if that property is sold in the future, let's imagine that you You've got family buried and a generation goes by, they sell the property and some children are out in the backyard and they start digging around and here comes a skull. Oops, you have a crime scene on your hand. So be sure that you have cleared everything with your um, health department and that you do in fact follow through with that map on your real estate deed. I actually, we've talked about this in Death Cafe on more than one occasion. Some people just could never buy a house where there were people buried on the property. And then there are those of us who think there are, I'd be out there every day talking to them. I think it's wonderful. Myth 11. Cremation is always the best choice for, but whoops, let me go back. 
uh, I skipped ahead and I didn't mean to do that. There we go. Cremation is always the best choice for budget-minded families. Well, most people do choose cremation based on cost, especially after Jessica Mitford's expose of the funeral business. No doubt it is cheaper. It is very much cheaper usually. Um, and we're a mobile society. People are hardly ever in the place where they were born and raised. And so sometimes it makes a lot of sense. But what about the environmental cost of cremation? North America uses enough fossil fuel for cremation to drive you halfway to the sun every year. These fuels are maintained at 1900 degrees Fahrenheit for two plus hours. One cremation equals about 25 gallons of gas or like driving 450 miles and produces about 250 pounds of carbon dioxide. Plus, I always like to point out that a lot of people are like, oh gosh, I have these ashes, now what? And it's sad if they end up on your mantle and eventually if a service or a com commemorative burial event is not held and you're just stuck with these ashes on a mantle. Um, there's other final dispos disposition choices, including green or natural burial, which don't use any fossil fuels or render your body's usefulness inert. You can donate your body to a medical school. Just be sure you have a plan B in case at the last minute, for whatever reason, the medical school can't accept your body. And of course, the best way to save money is to plan ahead. Myth number 12. People don't want to talk about that. Well, I guess that's why I've been hosting a death cafe in Mebbin for eight years. Um, <laughs> we love to talk about death and dying and not in a macabre way. I guarantee if you um, come to this death cafe, you might leave laughing. Um, talking about death is very much like talking about sex. You give somebody a safe space and let them know that it's okay, you can't shut them up. We, we uh, unfortunately live in a death phobic society and we see people planning for births, graduations, weddings, retirements. And the one thing that we are absolutely certain will happen to us all, nobody talks about it and Rarely, if ever, have they planned for it. So um, I suggest that you write out your hopes for your funeral choices, your final disposition, as Ann Weston is always telling us. Plan it, write it, tell it. And I assure you, this will be the greatest gift you ever give your family. I think many of us are just one bad funeral service away from not wanting to talk about it, not wanting to plan it. So think about these things. It's, I know it's difficult, but, or come to a death cafe and have some fun with us. Hey, you graduated. This is, I'm just going to leave my information up there for a minute. Um, phone number, the website for Funeral Consumers Alliance, North Carolina. I invite all of you to visit that website. We would love to have you become a member. It's $25 for your whole life or just your support. And 
thank you again for the privilege of your time. I can't wait to see which of these 12 funeral myths surprised you the most. And let's go answer a bunch of questions. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> um, right now, we don't have any questions in the chat. Um, so folks, if you want to speak up or add them to the chat, you can. But Sarah, I wanted to ask about the essential oils when folks choose not to do the embalming route. Um, I know you had mentioned the ice packs and essential oils. Can you speak to what type of essential oils and maybe what the purpose of that would be? Yeah, usually I ask the family, do they have um, the very first home funeral I did, um, the sister of the woman who had died, her sister brought out essential oil. It was by that company, I think it's called Times, T-H-Y-M-E-S, it's kind of expensive, but it smelled just like a pine forest. And she said, I wanna use this because we used to play in the woods. So what I do, I ask, I have a, the first thing I'll ask them to get is a beautiful bowl. I'll fill it with really, really warm water. We put the oil in that, maybe float rose petals or rosemary. And then in this case, she had added that. So the aroma is just, it's just beautiful. And they all have um, a washcloth. If, they have, if a person has died under hospice care, hospice does a wonderful job of washing the body and they're easy. They understand home funeral guides. So I can work in tandem with them real easily. But the oil is just, it's part of the ritual. It smells lovely. Um, I mean, dead bodies don't stink, y'all. They just don't. But they're not a live body. So there might be, I don't know, a stale smell maybe, but it's nothing bad. It's just the oils are um, anoint, and I use them as I'm helping them anoint the body before they're shrouded or put in their coffin. That was a long answer to a short question. Sorry, Lydia. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That's really interesting. I appreciate that. We do have some questions flowing in. So Lydia, look. Yeah, Lydia, but before you start with those, I did see, Karen, did you have your hand up in the, to ask a question? I just wanted to knock out the two hands that I saw before we moved yeah. to, because I know we have a lot in the chat. Karen, can you unmute yourself? Sorry. Um, thank you for taking my question. When do you meet in Mebbin for your death cafe? And are you meeting now with COVID? We're meeting virtually, Karen, and my next meeting is the 23rd. We meet from six to eight in the Zoom room. If you are interested, um, shoot me an email or you can actually go to deathcafe.com. Oh, okay. And search for a death cafe near me. <laughs> or find or, or Google Death Cafe Mebbin. And what I do is send out the link to the Zoom room a few days prior to the meeting. Okay. So for everyone who's attending the meeting right now, you will receive an email from me with Sarah's contact information and her website information. So you'll have access to all of that as well. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know whether to say, Shanae, that today I'm talking in my role as president of the Funeral Consumers Alliance, but over here, I have another role as a home funeral guide and a celebrant, and I have a different website, Shrouding Sisters. So if that interests you at all, um, you can- Sarah, we'll, we'll send out all of your information so they can have everything for you. And just really quickly, Ray, did you have a question? I saw the little hand icon up. 
I had a couple and then I had sent them to sent to the wrong person, I guess. Um, one of my questions is, I, I'm curious why people wash the body after death. Why? Mm. I mean, I think it's something we've done since the beginning of time. Right. Even, so, if, even if it's not a full dunk or a full soak, even if you're ritually taking a washcloth with the essential oil on it and touching like this and recalling uh, qualities of that person. I have a ritual, a ceremony I go through. We remember the words you said from your mouth or how your eyes looked upon us with love. It just gets the family it's muscle work. They're they're in this remembering their loved one. And then my second question was, doesn't it take a while to get a death certificate? And if so, wouldn't that delay access to the pay on death account? Um, from what I understand, if you have presented the bank with notification of death, or you have proof that the person has died, maybe, and they know, you can tell the, the bank that the death certificate has been filed, I think there won't be a problem. Actually, I've never had to do this, <laughs> but I just know this is, the, this is the information that's been handed down to me. And, what we don't want to happen is everybody giving money to prepay at funeral homes and then losing their money for whatever reason. Although I have plenty of funeral directors telling me they're, they will guarantee your money's not going anywhere, it's staying right there, nothing's gonna change. What you pay today will take care of you in 20 years. So personal choice. Thanks. Okay. Right. Lydia, we'll go ahead and, and move over to you. I know you have several questions. I've seen them popping up in the chat, so go ahead. Yes, I'll go next to Imogene. Imogene asks, what is required for burial in a green or natural cemetery? Well, Ann Weston's on this call and she'll fuss at me if I miss anything. A green or natural cemetery. There will be no embalmed body. You are in a natural container, such as a shroud, a pine box, a cardboard cremation box that children have decorated. And there's no vault, no grave liner. You go into the ground naturally and you decompose naturally. All right. And Charlotte is asking you to repeat the death certificate statement for North Carolina. The statutes? North Carolina General Statute 130A-112 and 130A-115. You'll see them when you Look these up. I can, I wish maybe in the future I can add this to my slide. It will say in this language, and I quote, the funeral director or person acting as such, that's me or you or your people. The important thing we live in a home funeral friendly state and you have, you have the right and this is not rocket science nor do you need to be afraid that you can't do it. You can. Our next question is what steps are involved in cremation? Well, let's say that Aunt Bessie dies and the family has contacted um, the ABC funeral home for a direct cremation. That means 
The funeral home will come retrieve the body, cremate the body in their cream their crematory, their crematorium, or take the body elsewhere to be cremated, and then return the remains, the ashes to the family. Now, if you're going to be a savvy funeral shopper and you're reading the fine print on that general price list, please be sure that when you're comparing prices for direct cremation, that the funeral homes, you're reading their price list, that it actually includes the price of cremation, that it has is the cremation fee, which is usually about $350. Some, you can't believe how the language is not clear on some of these price lists. So if a funeral home or crematory quotes you a price of $1,000 for a, crema a direct cremation, you need to ask them, does that include the cremation, the actual cremation? because it may not. You may have paid $1,000, then when you get the bill for $1,350, you're like, well, what's that $350 for? That was for the cremation. So can I get a side of cremation with my cremation? That's about the, and that, this, ha you can't believe this, this really happens. If you could go, you ought to tootle around and go to some funeral homes and get their price list and just check out the difference, differences in the same service, in the same town for the same service. Our next uh, but again, I'm not bashing. I'm simply trying to, you know, get you to be smart shoppers. Lee Pickett asked, would you address water cremation as well? So maybe speak to the process and the financial aspect of that, Sarah. So that water cremation, it just sounds funny when we say that, doesn't it? Water cremation, because cremation comes from the Latin word for fire. We're used to fire cremation, but water cremation has actually been around for quite a while. They have, um, I think it's veteran, veterinarians have used it. And what it, it's referred to as alkaline hydrolysis, aquamation, or water cremation. And the body is kind of laid in this warm bath. And there is lye, L-Y-E, in the solution. And you dissolve. And what comes back is a much wider looking remains than with fire cremation. And it cost about the same. We have two uh, funeral homes in North Carolina that actually have equipment for water cremation. One's in Shelby and one's in Wilmington. And Desmond Tutu chose, this is uh, a lot of um, people are, you know, they're like, what? He chose what? Yeah. So he was kind of educating us up to the very end. Um, and you can, I gave you the simple version of, I mean, you can look up the temperature and what is exactly in that solution, but that was the 25 cent version. Sarah, Nancy is asking, many people who have cancer will have a quote, cancer odor. Does this dissipate after death when the body is cleaned? Yes. Especially when I'm using beautiful oils. <laughs> Several people that I have done the home funerals for were cancer patients. All right, our next question, when the time comes, I want to be buried at the new conservation cemetery in Orange County. My family prefers not to have to hold my body at home until out of town family arrives. Can I trust a funeral home not to embalm my body 
which would prevent burial at the conservation cemetery? Oh, what a great question. And that, let me give you the name of the new conservation burial ground in Cedar Grove. The name of the cemetery is blue, like the color stem, like on a plant, blue stem. So if you Google blue stem burial ground or blue stem cemetery, it'll come up. And every single funeral home that I could even imagine has a chiller, a refrigeration unit. And they can store a body for a, a, a fee. But yeah, you better, they better be listening to you, the smart consumer, when you say, I'm only going to be here. I want this body chilled for two or three days. That's Oh, that's the only service they're to provide, nothing else. And you as the savvy consumer now have the right to, find, to shop around and see which funeral home has the cheapest refrigeration fee, storage fee. Karen asked, what was the name of the burial savings program that can be arranged at the bank? Oh yeah, the, the funeral plan. It's P-O-D, payable on death, often referred to as a Totten, T-O-T-T-E-N, trust. I think that here in Carborough, the green burial must be done within two days. If so, it sounds like you don't have time to gather your out of town family. Is that true? No, I don't think that is true. I just did a home funeral and the green, the green cemetery in Carborough is the old town cemetery there at the Armadillo Grill. You know where I'm talking about the railroad tracks. Um, and once you notify the grave digger, I mean, you notify the, if you purchased your plot and notified the city, they mark the plot. I mean, the plot's waiting for the grave digger, the backhoe operator. So I don't think, I don't think you have to, there's a two day limit. Um, yeah. All right, the I mean, next I, question. I know uh, bodies have been kept, usually three days is the limit for bodies. The fam, you know, the families there, the, they've had their time uh, with Aunt Bessie and they're, they're, they've worked, they're working through their grief with a lot of muscle work um, and they're ready. Can you spread ashes anywhere? Specifically, what about Jordan Lake? Don't ask, don't tell, that's all I'm saying. And if you've got those ashes, be aware that when the funeral home returns them to you, there's often a silver ID tag. You better make good and sure that that tag's not on there. Cause if somebody finds the tag, they could call, they, they could go, oh, yikes. I, you know, me and cremains, I, I, they're, they're inert. They're not good for any flora. People that want to put the cremains and grow a tree, well, it's probably going to kill the tree, honestly. But nobody, do you know how many people are scattering ashes at the Grand Canyon every year? A bunch. And apparently there's some code at Disney World. They've gotten so savvy about people coming through Disney World. And they, if anybody, Ann, do you remember what the, I mean, they, they get on the PA system and go code something like sweeper or something like that. Cause they've, they've figured out people are bringing ashes and spreading them through the park. Just be careful. Don't, don't ask, don't tell. I mean, it's not good 
I can just say that much. It's not good for any, um, you know, plants, outdoor plants. It's inert. They're, it's. So just to chime in really quickly on that, um, blue stem um, does a, a great explanation of cremation because one of the questions that's often asked of them is will you be able to spread your ashes there at the, the blue stem um, site? And the answer is yes. But of course, the explanation that they give, and they are far more eloquent about this than I am. So I'm summarizing really quickly here. Um, our ashes are, are very acidic. So there's a solution that has to be mixed in with your ashes to make them more basic so that it does not kill all of the vegetation and the foliage. So there will be, from my understanding, a designated area um, at Blue Stem that offers this. But um, like I said, they give far more information and they're far more eloquent with it when they explain it, but. Thanks, Shanae. That's exactly what I was trying to say. Usually what I say is, pardon the French, there's more nutrients in bird shit than there is in cremains. <laughs> that's just, <laughs> that's the truth. <clears throat> Be careful if you're scattering ashes. All right, next question is from Nancy. Very quick, crazy question, but can a home cremation occur? No, that's illegal. In the state of North Carolina, burning a human body is illegal. However, however, I was told that years ago on the east campus of Duke University, um, a, a doctor, um, a Hindu or a Buddhist was, was cremated. Um, what, how that happened, I don't know. Is this fact or fiction? I don't know. But I would suggest you don't try this in your backyard. I'm pretty sure it's illegal. All right. She just put in, home cremation has been a family joke. That is why I asked. Say again, oh, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see, okay, our next question, question is from Jim Russo. I have arranged to donate my remains to the Duke Medical School. When they're done with them, they cremate the remains. Any way to avoid the cremation? Um, Jim, I think you'd have to speak directly to the staff there. It's. It, it's funny you ask this question because um, I have an attendee at my death cafe and he didn't want to, he does not want to be cremated. He'll be donating his body to Elon University. And we did a deep dive to see, is it, um, which was better to take the hyper embalmed remains to be buried in his churchyard or the cremains. And we found out that actually it was greener to bury his hyper embalmed remains. So Elon will give his family back the body before cremation. So you have a precedent and maybe you should go talk to the anatomical gift people at Duke. Maybe they will work with you. Is that what you were thinking? That just to take what's left of me to be buried naturally? Yes, that's exactly what I was looking for. Yeah. So I'll talk to the Duke folks. Okay, good luck with that. Thanks. All right, and then Carl, I see your message about missing the presentation. Uh, we did record the program from Sarah and it will be available 
Um, Shanae, you said the Orange County website is where it'll be posted, correct? So we'll, we'll have a, a couple of different options for everyone who attended the program. Sarah's contact information will be provided um, for all of her, her different sites and email addresses and the link to the recording will also be provided. But the, the link for those that have not attended will be available via the Orange County Department on Aging website using um, our YouTube channel. So it'll be posted there. All right, that is all of the questions. So I want what, a what a great group and thanks. You well, can tell you have, I, get a, I get a little worked up and passionate you, about this stuff. You have one more that's come in, Sarah. Okay. Actually, you have two more that have come in. So hold on, you're not done yet. Um, <laughs> so Ray, you had a question and then once you're done, we'll, we'll go to Megan. No, 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 I'm clapping. Clapping, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> it looked like the little hand for just a second. It was, it's a clapping hand, sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Um, can I just make a statement? So in early December, I had a, a good friend of mine pass away, and, and that was the first green funeral I went to. And it was just so touching. He did the cardboard box, and we all wrote on it. And it, and it was hard when you stepped up there, but we all wrote him a message. And then we put roses on top. And then they lowered him down. He was not embalmed. And, um, but it, and it was pretty special. And we just went around there. I don't know how many of us were there. And we just talked about this person. And um, yeah, it was pretty special. Yeah. So there's also green burial sites at um, United Methodist Church out in Hillsborough. They have some for sale. And the minister there was very, very good because I went with my friend to arrange everything. So, they're out there. Thank you for sharing that, Karen. Well, yeah. I just want to do one more ask for, for any questions that you all might have. Um, and also, I just want to thank Sarah for joining us this afternoon and for the wonderful presentation that, that you offered. Um, I know there's always new information and valuable information that I learned from you. So I hope that all of our attendees will, will be able to take some helpful tidbits away with them. And if anyone has any additional questions for Sarah, um, like I said, you'll all be given her contact information so that you can contact her directly. Um, I'd also, again, like to thank the End of Life Choices Senior Resource Team. These programs are brainchilds of, of theirs. So thank you to all of our, our SRT members that, that push these programs out to make sure that we're providing the education and the support and the resources for our community. So. Um, you see one the, more came in, Shanae? I, I do. So Marie, did you have a question? You're muted. You want to unmute for us? I put it in the chat. Thank you. You put it in the chat? Okay. Yes. The question is, um, there was a mention about local people who made the, there was, you had mentioned mid presentation and would you be sharing that information again? So Sarah mentioned the, the um, the coffin maker. I'm yes. assuming that's the okay. Yes, we'll provide that information as well. We'll put it and there. and the shroud maker. Yeah, the shroud yeah. Maker. I'll, I'll 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 make sure that I get that information from Sarah so that we can we can send that out to everybody. Well, I just want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, and thank you all for your questions and your engagement. And we look forward to seeing you at our, our next program. So thank you. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you all thank so you. much.